Hello everybody, welcome back. I hope you are well. I hope you're having a wonderful, wonderful weekend or have had a wonderful weekend, I should probably say, by the time this episode will be released. Welcome back to Utter Truth with Hayden Appleby. This is, of course, the place where we share the truth, welcome discussion and remain uncensored. We cannot be bought by the state over here. And so you might notice that my glasses are missing today, but do not worry, it will not hinder or impact the discussions, the vital discussions we are about to have in any way. And oh boy, is there a lot of them. Do we have a lot to plunge through today with massive debates taking place right now in Make America Great Again circles about the issues of abortion and IVF in particular. It is causing a lot of division with and between conservatives after the Trump campaign made some quite divisive comments and statements regarding it. So we're going to look at them and I'm going to explain to you why it is right to be pro-life. I'm going to present the pro-life argument to you. And last but not least, a hot take about how the left has changed, how it has morphed into something dark and sinister. Please do consider subscribing, do give this video and episode a nice big thumbs up, support the show because we are all independent here and I hope you enjoy. So how would you respond if I delivered the statement, Trump is not pro-life? Or perhaps a more fair statement, Trump is not pro-life enough. How would you respond if I said that? If I said that shocking thing? Perhaps you'd do a double take. Perhaps you'd wonder whether I have gone mad. After all, this is Trump, right? He worked with pro-life Mike Pence for years. It was under his administration that we saw the historic overturning of Roe v. Wade. He's a champion for pro-life issues, right? Well, Guys, what have we missed? It turns out that there is yet another fiery feud causing conservatives, Christians, truth seekers, all of us, to turn on each other, causing division amidst the lot of us, causing all of us to question what the right side of history actually is and splitting us up. We've seen that a lot with Israel and Palestine. Individuals who are conservative Christians and have normally agreed on every issue, agree on the issue of gender, agree on things like vaccine mandates, on immigration. We agree on it all. But Israel and Palestine, oh boy, did that cause a split in the middle. And did we see the clear difference between neocons, conservatives who are really in it for the money and the power and are not truly awake, and those of us who are actually seeking the truth and what is right. We've always seen it with inconvenient issues like that one. And it really is something that fascinates me. Because where it may be easier with the issue of immigration to debate that and to look all right-wing and cool and argue against it as some strong conservative voice, those same individuals do not argue for ethics in other scenarios. Some of them, of course. And in this case, it is the issue of abortion and actually just the issue of life, of living human beings that has caused this split after Donald Trump and J.D. Vance have raised the already pretty high bar for the conservative Christian vote. But how have they done that? Well, let's take a look together at the clip, the incredibly viral clip, where Trump makes the statement that really has contributed to all of this debate. In Florida, the state that you are a resident of, there's an uh, abortion-related amendment on the ballot to overturn the six-week ban in Florida. How are you going to vote on that? Well, I think the six-week is too short. Uh, It has to be more time, and so that's, and I've told them that I want more weeks. So you'll vote in favor of the amendment? I'm I'm voting that, I am going to be voting that we need more than six weeks. Look, just so you understand, everybody wanted Roe v. Wade terminated for years, 52 years. 
I got it done. They wanted it to go back to the States. Exceptions are very important for me, for Ronald Reagan, for others that have navigated this very, very interesting and difficult path. Um, there we go. That's, that's that then. Um, Donald Trump discussing how absolutely awful a six-week abortion ban is and how unfair it is and how he believes in exceptions and ultimately how he's pretty pro-choice. So what he is referring to there and what's being discussed in that brief interview that for some reason he is conducting with the mainstream media is how he will vote specifically on the issue of Amendment 4 in Florida which is an issue that has certainly been cropping up a lot, especially with the fabulous Ron DeSantis as governor of that great state, who is, as far as I can tell, very pro-life, a great advocate for unborn children. And so what is Amendment 4 in particular? Well, if we read from Ballotpedia.org, it is known as the Right to Abortion Initiative, And voting for the amendment would mean voting in support of adding the following language to Florida's Constitution Declaration of Rights. So, first and foremost, if you vote yes in support of Amendment 4, quote, a yes vote supports adding the following language to the Florida Constitution's Declaration of Rights. Quote, no law shall prohibit penalize, delay, or restrict abortion before viability, or when necessary to protect the patient's health as determined by the patient's healthcare provider. So, if you vote in favour of Amendment 4, you are voting for that phrase to be added to the Florida Constitution, that no law will essentially prohibit abortion before viability or after viability if there is a risk to the patient's health, to the woman's health. And essentially a no vote, so voting against Amendment 4, would oppose adding these words to the Constitution. And in order for Amendment 4 to pass, a 60% approval supermajority is needed. But what does this amendment actually mean? Well, in layman's terms, it means that the state cannot interfere or make any laws in relation to women having abortions before the viability of the baby. So according to NBC News, that's around 24 weeks. So if Amendment 4 passes, DeSantis would not be able to implement any law preventing abortions from taking place before 24 weeks weeks, which is six months through the pregnancy. And as you can also read, abortions essentially, up to birth, late-term abortions, will also be legal if this amendment goes through, if it is necessary for the woman's health. But the problem with phrases like that is how ambiguous they are. What each medical professional sees as necessary for a woman's health may vary. And so, therefore, if this amendment was to pass, God forbid, then the current six-week abortion ban that was put in place in May in Florida would be overhauled. It would be broken. It would be removed from the Constitution. So it's an important amendment. This is a vital amendment. It's going to hugely change abortion law in Florida. And thus, for Trump to almost criticise the six-week ban and imply his support of Amendment 4, despite the fact that a baby's heart starts beating at about five weeks, not six, five. Yeah, that's understandably upset a lot of pro-lifers, and that has understandably made us massively consider our vote to some extent, our vote especially on some of these key policy issues. Not to mention the fact that Trump previously called DeSantis's six-week abortion ban a, quote, terrible thing in September last year. So, to be clear from the offset, Trump has never 
been objectively pro-life. And I suppose you could say it depends on how you're defining pro-life. If you mean he's better than his abortion fanatic opponent, then yeah, absolutely. He's certainly more pro-life than her. But if you mean he is willing to ban abortion for most or even for any reason, then then no, he has never had that perspective. And he's actually made it clear that he is opposed to that perspective. So it does annoy me that people are suddenly acting like this is some massive shock out of nowhere, like he's had a huge change of heart. No, abortion has never really been a massive issue for him. He is far more the president of immigration. You know, that is his focus. He's the president of a wide range of issues. But abortion just isn't one that he's that contentious on, in my opinion. And I've never actually been a huge Make America Great Again fan, like belonged solely to that camp. I'm not someone who buys the Trump merch and supports him and roots for him no matter what he says and agrees with absolutely every viewpoint that Donald Trump will share. No, I've criticised him for many things, for quite a few things, and on various issues, because he is far from perfect. He is just like every other human being, flawed and imperfect. They're like that in politics, just like in the real world. I am a Christian. I'll say it again. I am a Christian. I am a conservative. I am here to seek the truth and do what is ethically right. It is not about, at the end of the day, and I want to make this really clear, it is not about staying loyal to the right. It is about staying loyal to what is right. And if that, in some cases, might come in contradiction to what Donald Trump is saying, then that's okay. You're allowed to disagree with the guy. You're allowed to critique him for his viewpoints, but still potentially support giving him your vote or being on his side more than the opponent's side, which we'll get to properly shortly, whether or not I support him and where I think we should go with this. But first and foremost... It's vital for us to see what others have been saying, what has been said in the pro-life movement before we move into something far deeper, because he has been criticised by lots of people, by lots of people I follow, I support, I root for, by lots of people who really do seem to stand up for the truth. And the reason for that is because just before the Trump video was released, where he implies that he will not be voting against Amendment 4, but will be supporting it. Just before that, Trump's running mate, J.D. Vance, conducted an interview with the mainstream media also, and he, he had this to say about him and Trump's approach to a proposed abortion ban. Take a look. Democrats made the case this week and beyond this week that Donald Trump, if elected, will impose a federal ban on abortion if he wins. Now, Donald Trump says he won't, but can you commit, Senator, sitting right here with me today, that if you and Donald Trump are elected, that you will not impose a federal ban on abortion? I can absolutely commit that, Kristen, and Donald Trump has been as clear about that as possible. I I think it's important to step back and say, What has Donald Trump actually said on the abortion question, and how is it different from what Kamala Harris and the Democrats have said? Donald Trump wants to end this culture war over this particular topic. If Kamala, excuse me, if California wants to have a different abortion policy from Ohio, then Ohio has to respect California and California has to respect Ohio. Donald Trump's view is that we want the individual states and their individual cultures and their unique political sensibilities to make these decisions because we don't want to have a nonstop federal conflict over this issue, the federal government ought to be focused on getting food prices down, getting housing prices down, issues, of course, where Kamala Harris has been a total disaster. So I think Donald Trump is right. We want the federal government to focus on these big economic and immigration questions. Let the states figure out their own abortion policy. Let me just follow up with you a little bit on that point, because I've been talking to Republicans, including Senator Lindsey Graham just last week, who've made it very clear 
that if Donald Trump is elected, if you are elected, they will continue to press this point. Senator Graham said to me, I'm going to keep saying that there should be a federal ban. If such a piece of legislation landed on Donald Trump's desk, would he veto it? Well, I think it'd be very clear he would not support it. I mean, he but said he that veto explicitly. It? Yeah, I, th I mean, if you're not supporting it as the president of the United States, you fundamentally so have to veto, veto it. So he would veto a federal abortion ban? I think he would. He said that explicitly that he would. Yes. So there we go. There we go. It is clear. These two are never going to implement any form of an abortion ban, which is fascinating because Vance is supposedly a Catholic, and yet here he is, kind of just not caring that much about the issue, like we see in some senses with Trump. And so it's important that we know that they've been clear that is not a possibility, even for late-term abortions, the implementation of a ban. And so people are not happy. And one of these people is Lila Rose. And she is the founder, the CEO, if you like, of Live Action, which is an organization that puts out a great deal of vital content. I mean, there is some controversy there about where they put all of their money, whether Lila spends too much on big events and things like this. I haven't delved into that. All I can tell you for a fact is that a lot of the content they produce is vital, is so, so important, and is really powerful and effective in sharing the pro-life message. So she is a huge leader, huge leader in this movement for truth and life. And she tweeted in regard to this Vance interview, quote, if you don't stand for pro-life principles, you don't get pro-life votes. And this is a fascinating tweet for many, many reasons. And it really did go viral. Millions of views. And this is where the split started to form once again on this key policy issue among conservatives. I've actually never seen so many abortion-related tweets blowing up on my feed. People saying they're going to abstain from voting for Trump and so on and so forth. It's a huge topic right now. Such as this Twitter user, Melissa, who wrote, without a major reversal, I truly think we will look back on this as the moment Donald Trump lost the election. This is incomprehensible. And the renowned and great Ali Beth Stuckey wrote, quote, I am fighting hard to get Christian women engaged in and enthusiastic about this election. Abortion is their biggest, though not only, issue, doing everything I can to warn them against a Kamala presidency. Statements like this make that much, much more difficult. And a lot of this was either referring to what Vance said or what Trump said in his separate interview with the MSM. And it's fascinating. It's fascinating to see this split. And so, first and foremost, Lila's certainly got a point. All of them have. Ali's got a point. Melissa's got a point. Because the main body of Vance's argument here in his interview seems to be, well, we prefer it in the hands of the states because at least then some states can be strongly opposed to it and others can do what they like. But I'm sorry, that is, that is not the way you should look at this issue, especially if you claim to be pro-life and stand for life. Does that mean that babies in California with the far left Gavin Newsom are less valuable than babies in Texas? Oh, Texas will be more likely to ban abortion than the far left California. But that's all right. You know, at least we're saving babies in Texas. No, no, no. That's not all right, Vance. It's not all right, Trump. It is not all right, guys. As a Catholic... J.D. Vance, you should know that. Babies deserve protection in every single state, every city. We don't get to say, well, it's not a federal issue. So, you know, it's just a shame if they if they die in their millions in separate states. It's not our state, so... No, no, no. Babies matter. And their location inside or outside the womb, their house, their address... That does not change that fact. And also, just to criticise the Trump-Vance campaign even further on this issue, 
When he says that the job of the federal government in that clip should be issues of immigration and the economy, you know, making sure people can feed their families, put food on the table, pay their rent, but abortion should remain in the states. That shouldn't be a federal issue. What he's essentially doing there is he is downplaying the issue of abortion. He is implying it's not as important as issues like immigration and the economy. That's what he's doing. And a hell of a lot of conservatives do this. I genuinely don't understand it. Why should immigration be a federal issue but abortion shouldn't? Why should the economy, your rent, how much we tax you, be more important than the murder of babies? Don't get me wrong. These issues, the economy, immigration, they're all important. But so is abortion. So is euthanasia. So is the very principle of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You don't get to focus on liberty and the pursuit of happiness and just forget all about life. Oh, it's just an issue for the states. No. What they are doing there is implying it is less important than the ones that will win them the votes. And that's a shame. You know, that really is a shame. I'm getting tired of people claiming to be pro-life but barely talking about the issue. It's like the bottom of their concern list. Actually, guys, no. It's one of the most pivotal ones facing the country and facing the entire world. Because no children are going to get a say on the border or a say on their future or their indoctrination or the economy or all of these other issues if they have their life ripped from them before they even exit the birth canal. This should be a primary issue. And so I urge Republicans, I urge conservatives to please just grow a spine. Grow a spine and be stronger and tougher on it. And I also urge social media users and influencers who claim to seek the truth and who claim to fight corruption, I urge them to care a little about this issue too. For example, Andrew Tate. Oh my goodness, I'm not impressed with him right now. Andrew Tate, who had a little message for people who are just so bothered about baby murder. Let's take a look. Conservatives are losers. We all knew this, which is why they perpetually lose to the biggest losers in the world, which are liberals. But I've logged onto Twitter this morning and all the conservatives are crying their eyes out because Trump is passing some bill that allowed the states to decide abortion as opposed to it being nationally decided. And all the conservatives are having a breakdown. Oh my God, we can't vote for Trump because of the abortion, 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 abortion. You're not going to vote for Trump over abortion. Don't you think we need a border? Don't you think the economy needs fixing before China perpetually buries us? You think once China's in charge of the world, they're ever going to give USA a chance to recover ever? No. Um, yeah, I do think we need a border. And I do think the economy is important. I also think like life that's that's quite important and like tearing apart or poisoning babies in the womb quite a key issue too andrew they'll have the big stack and we'll get wrecked who gives a fuck who gives a fuck the conservatives crying about abortion are as stupid as the liberals crying about it if some woman wants to kill her own offspring then she's a dumbass let her do it she's a fucking idiot who gives a shit why would you even outlaw this Oh my god. We're going to force women who don't want kids to have the kid. I'm sure it's going to grow up in a nice stable home. I'm sure that's not going to fucking add to the crime rate. If you want a fucking one fucking shot to head snipe your own children, then fucking do it. I don't care. The fat conservatives are complaining and saying they're not going to vote for Trump, who's going to fix the economy, secure the border, prevent World War fucking three. You're worried about the death of children. How about World War three? Iran, Israel. Or Russia, Ukraine. Oh, but, but abortion? You're a fucking retard. There's more important things to worry about. All the conservatives crying their fucking eyes out are dumb. Who fucking cares? Liberals are stupid because they vote on abortion policy above all of the important things like border security and economy in World War III. You're stupid because you're doing the same thing. I honestly couldn't give a fuck. Yeah, we can no tell. No I get pregnant is ever going to get an abortion because she's going to be like, wow, genetic master race from a millionaire. So it ain't my problem. Sounds like a brokey problem. 
And perhaps if everyone wasn't so broke, if we fixed the economy, they wouldn't all be fucking aborting their kids. So if you care so much about the lives of children, you should care more about the border and preventing murderers coming over and killing children as opposed to crying your eyes out that Trump has made it slightly easier or harder, depending on the state, to fucking nuke your own child. Everyone's a loser. Wow. Um, <clears throat> yep. Yeah. So, um, what we're seeing there is, again, the bones, the very spirit of the pro-choice, the pro-abortion movement running through Andrew Tate. Andrew Tate, a man who we as the right have platformed so, so, so much. A man who, with some issues, does speak the truth. And there he is, sat there, making the pro-choice argument. Well, if a woman wants to kill her own child, she's a dumbass, so just let her. Number one, you will not find... 99.9% of pro-lifers calling women who get abortions dumbasses because you know something we see them as secondary victims we see them as secondary victims it's the reason when we make the pro-life argument a part of that argument isn't just the ending of babies lives it's the traumatizing of women and it's their health it's their mental health it's their well-being so everything about What we have just watched Andrew Tate say is utterly ridiculous and so inhumane. This idea that you can somehow just care about one issue. Oh my God, stop talking about abortion. Just talk about the border. No, no, no. It's possible to care about both and vote accordingly for both. And that really does tell you everything you need to know about Andrew Tate. It's a disappointment because he does speak a lot of truth. Like, on a lot of issues. He's fearless in his speaking of the truth, you know. Absolutely, I'm not disputing that. But clearly this issue just doesn't matter to him. It's extremely disappointing to see when this man claims to be a traditional Muslim who critiques all the modern lies of the world that we're told and progressivism and all of this. While the issue might not get him as many followers as discussing feminism would, it matters. It's an issue that matters, and he needs to grow up on this issue as far as I'm concerned. It's an issue that ruins women's lives and takes babies. So, women are not dumbasses. It's not something you can just not give an F about, Andrew. And it's disappointing to see this video like it actually is. I I was, I was was a bit disappointed. Because just like the right-wing influencers out there who occasionally spit truth, but then on other issues they daren't touch them or truly grow a spine because it probably wouldn't be convenient for them. Yeah, it seems a little bit like what Andrew's doing in this video. And so he needs to wake up and I hope that we may contribute to his waking up just like I hope we may with Trump. Because take a look at this clip that started circulating of Trump decades ago discussing the issue. I lived in New York City and Manhattan all my life, okay? So, you know, my views are a little bit different than if I lived in Iowa, perhaps, but it's not something that would disturb me. Partial birth abortion, the eliminating of of abortion in the third trimester, big issue in Washington. Would President Trump ban partial birth abortion? Well, look, I'm, I'm... very pro-choice. I hate the concept of abortion. I hate it. I hate everything it stands for. I cringe when I listen to people debating the subject. But you still, I just believe in choice. And again, it may be a little bit of a New York background because there is some different attitude in different parts of the country. And, you know, I was raised in New York and grew up and work and everything else in New York City. But I am strongly for choice, and yet I hate the concept of abortion. But you would not ban it? No. Or ban partial birth abortion? No, I would, I would, I am, I am pro-choice in every respect and as far as it goes, but I just... (laughs) There we go, people. There we go. That doesn't seem super pro-life to me either. In fact, it kind of seems a bit like textbook definition pro-choice arguments. But of course, I do recognise that 
people change and there's no way that we can demand that everyone be correct on everything they've ever said throughout their lives you know I was probably more liberal leaning a few years ago myself you know the whole point of awakening is that it requires you to at some point first have been asleep or there's no point in waking up so it's not entirely fair I know to take a couple of interview snippets from three decades ago and use it to discredit Trump today because what we now know is he is better than his opponent he did see the overturning of Roe v Wade and so I'll be a bit clearer in a moment on what I feel the next steps should be but I did just want to show you that clip from the past because it's important he is not the most pro-life guy you're gonna see or find he just isn't unfortunately But I want to take this opportunity quickly, since we are currently discussing the political nature of this debate, of the pro-life abortion debate, to actually present the pro-life argument and to explain why abortion is wrong and why we should stand up for women in fighting back against the manipulation and propaganda they face to get abortions. We should stand up for families and we should, of course, stand up for children and babies and the vulnerable. And so, Andrew, Vance, Trump, you guys, listen up. This applies to all people. And I want to be super clear about that too. Because I am tired. Oh my god, am I so tired of this thing. Of the notion that all pro-lifers are religious. Oh, it's so annoying. It is infuriating. Or that being religious is somehow a requirement, a prerequisite to being pro-life. It's so ludicrous. The, the idea that, oh my God, it's just the conservative Christians who are trying to take away my bodily autonomy. Absolutely ridiculous. I mean, in fact, there is this great Instagram account run by a woman, I might add, because, oh my God, what what a revelation. Women can be pro-life. It's not just men trying to take away your rights. No, women can be and in great numbers are pro-life. Um, and there's this great account run by this woman called Secular Pro-Life, which presents this exact case in such a powerful way presents the case that ultimately the only requirement you need to be against abortion is to have a moral compass, is to have a conscience and maybe a tiny, weeny bit of intelligence, but not religious belief. While religious belief can complement being against abortion and being against various issues, it is far from a requirement. And so why? Why is abortion wrong? Why are pro-lifers against it? Well, it is wrong for one, one (laughs) fundamental reason. There's a few, but one fundamentally. And that is because it is wrong to actively and intentionally end the life of a one, vulnerable, two, living, three, human, four, being. It is wrong to intentionally end the life of a vulnerable living human being, or we might say of any living human being, but it is especially wrong when they are so vulnerable. And so if we split this up categorically and we look at them all individually, number one, vulnerable. Well, babies in the womb are absolutely vulnerable. We can't hear their screams. We don't know when, if or when they are in pain. We, we don't know what's going on. They can't fight back. So they are absolutely vulnerable when the abortionist acts upon their bodies. So tick that damn box. Number two, human. Well, <laughs> yeah, I think hopefully most pro-choicers would also agree that babies in the womb are human. They are a member of the human species. They are not dogs or wolves or cats. So tick that box. Number three, a being. Um, Well, yeah, (laughs) we're all beings, animals, humans, we're all beings. So I think that box is kind of just automatically ticked. And number four, living. And this is where the disagreement occasionally comes in between pro-lifers and pro-choicers. 
but I'm afraid it's not an opinion. It is a fact that babies in the womb are living. They are alive. They are living human beings. The majority, virtually every biologist you would find, you could find, and virtually every biology textbook you pick up will teach you that life begins not at six weeks, not at 24 weeks, not when the baby leaves the birth canal. No, life begins at conception. Look it up on Google right now. Do it after you finish watching this. The fertilization of egg cell and sperm cell forms life. Grade one biology, guys. Life does not magically happen when the child exits the body. Life happens through fertilization. And so a one week old fetus is objectively and factually a living human being. We can have a debate about whether they deserve the right to life, about whether their life has meaning at one week. That is the the debate we can have with pro-choicers. But the debate of whether they are alive or not, that's not, it's just not a debate or it's a meaningless debate because there is an objective truth. Babies in the womb, they are growing, they are developing, thus they are living from the moment of conception. And the characteristics or the lack of development that baby has, that does not change that biological fact. And so Christians, we believe that before the Lord formed us in thy womb, he knew us, right? But that doesn't mean that being against abortion is solely a religious idea, a religious doctrine. Just like Christians wouldn't believe in stealing from something, we wouldn't believe it's right or ethical to wander in a shop and nick something because our religion teaches us that. It doesn't mean that atheists and people of other faiths all believe in stealing or should believe in stealing or will go around stealing. And in the same way, just because we don't believe in ending babies' lives and our religion and our religious beliefs complement that, that's not because of our religion alone. That's just because we have a moral conscience and we can see this industry for what it is. And so, sadly, I'm not suggesting for a moment that everyone who's pro-choice is evil. I have pro-choice friends, family members. I'm not suggesting that. Most of them, there are, there are a handful who are certainly evil, but most of them, I would say, are just manipulated to believe that what they are advocating for or believing in is right by a greedy industry who spends a lot of money, that spends a lot of money on advertising and profiting off the suffering of babies, oftentimes women, fathers, and whoever else, the destruction of families. And so overall, abortion is wrong because ending innocent lives is wrong. And it's never, ever the solution to a tough or an accidental situation or past suffering. Because often, well, always, it leads to more or at least somebody. But it's not just the issue of abortion and the ending of lives in regard to Trump that has sparked outrage recently. But also the issue of IVF, which we're going to touch on briefly. Because what did he say about IVF, you might be wondering? Was he a bit too light on that issue too? Well, actually... He wasn't just light on the issue. He wasn't just light on speaking about it or not being firm enough. But he was actually incredibly, incredibly pro it. Incredibly pro IVF to the extent that he said that the American taxpayer should fund said industry. Take a look at this. It is truly extraordinary. What's, what's the Trump administration going to do when it comes to IVF if you get elected? Right. Well, as you know, I was always for IVF right from the beginning. As soon as we heard about it, it's fertilization and it's helping women and men and families. Uh, but it's helping women uh, able to have a baby. Some have great difficulty and a lot of them have been very happy with the results, as you know. And what we're doing, and we're doing this because we just think it's great and we need 
great children, beautiful children in our country. We actually need them. And we are going to be, uh, under the Trump administration, we are going to be paying for that treatment. So we are paying for that treatment. All, all or Americans we're going, who want it? All, for, all Americans that get it, all Americans that need it. So we're going to be paying for that treatment, uh, or we're going to be mandating that the insurance company pay. <sighs> yes, 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 yes. So I do want, and I really do want to treat this subject and this topic sensitively, like I always try to treat the topic of abortion also acknowledging the arguments of both sides you know acknowledging the suffering people may have when making these decisions because it is emotional it's emotional for for so many people and i recognize that i i do get tired of us demonizing each other of us saying that you know everyone who's pro-choice as i just kind of mentioned they're all evil and everyone they then call us who is pro-life we're all like anti-women and misogynists i get tired of that kind of division no side is solely and completely heartless and cold because we just disagree and we need to bring the truth to the surface okay and so i do want to speak also in regard to the issue of ivf with great sensitivity because i recognize how much of a poignant topic it is for so many men women families couples but seeking the objective truth is nonetheless vital okay so the truth is ivf has helped and has changed the lives of many people it, it really has for the good okay nobody is denying that nobody is denying the wonder that ivf has brought to couples who cannot conceive and who want nothing more than to raise a family and I think this is why Trump is kind of voicing a massive support of it, because as a Christian who is all about procreation myself and sees it as so beautiful and loves the idea of creating families, I see how that would be lovely and how we should promote the raising of families as Christians. It's what we always do promote. And I sympathize with how hard, therefore, it must be to have the biological, the spiritual urge to bear children, but the inability to do so. It must be absolutely awful. I don't deny that, okay? So IVF has helped so many couples. But guys, we talk about abortion on and on and on. Well, some of us, <laughs> which is good. Absolutely, obviously. But the problems with the IVF industry aren't discussed as much and we're all to blame for that. Maybe it's because we don't see the problems as on the same level as abortion, maybe something along those lines, but it is vital that we acknowledge what the IVF industry has become. Because you see, it's become transactional, just like surrogacy, you know? As usual, something that started with good intentions has become an industry that causes a lot of harm. It destroys tens of thousands of embryos of living human beings, like we established earlier, every year. It is a form thus of eugenics, as people don't realise how dark it is discarding human beings when they're not right you know when they don't fit a certain category when they've got a disability or their genes aren't quite as lovely as you'd like them to be that is quite a dark path to go down that is a dark industry to embed in the conscience of the public and not to mention right the fact that it can often drive and complement the surrogacy industry too. They sometimes work together, um, and that is an industry that exploits so many women, that rents their wombs ultimately, but that is a whole separate discussion altogether, and we would need a separate episode for that, to dive into that. But the IVF industry, ultimately, the point I'm trying to make is that it does lead to the destruction of a lot of human life, even if this life is super undeveloped. In fact, according to one report, 96% of IVF embryos are discarded as mere trash for a, <laughs> t 
total 4% roughly to be chosen and to actually be born. So for Trump, I see why he's coming at it from this angle. I do. I empathize with this one more than his very much politically miscalculated abortion angle. But to tell Christians like he is, to tell truth seekers like he has, that the state will be paying for this and kind of promoting the industry of IVF and what it's become, it's riled a lot of people up. And that also is fair enough. And so I hope you can see how nuanced this discussion is, but how important it is and sensitive, I know, but vital nonetheless. And so I pray that from this discussion, we won't get the usual division, the usual, oh, he hates women, all of this, but that the points raised can be acknowledged and healthily, that's a good word, healthily discussed. And so to round up this discussion, this important discussion that we're having, how do I conclude my thoughts on all of this? Well, Trump has, and this is important, now made it clear that he will actually be voting against Amendment 4. So that is some refreshing news for us all. Um, and it's really important to know that. Because ultimately the, the abortion, the IVF, the reproductive health care lie, and so on and so forth, is so very wrong. And we need to stand up against that now more than ever. I personally think that the conclusion we should form from all of this is actually quite obvious. While we should absolutely hold Trump accountable for his viewpoints on all of these issues, and while we must stand up for as many babies and children and lives as possible in this death-promoting Western culture in which we are living, the best way to do that in this case, in this two-person race we have in the US, is by voting for Trump. Just look at his opponents, guys. <laughs> look at Kamala. Look at Kamala and Joe and the way in which they have made their entire campaign and administration formed around this issue of children, whether they're not killing them, they're mutilating them <laughs> through these vast, divisive issues over the last few years. They really are extremists when it comes down to it. They are radical on this and they do not support the imposing of any time limits with abortion and the ending of lives. They regularly lie in relation to this topic about Trump and so on. So think about it. Just just think about it is what I'm going to say. I see where Lila was coming from with, you know, we shouldn't just throw our vote around and things. Absolutely not. But he is, Trump is 10 times better on this issue and many others than the coconut tree woman who hasn't even released an official policy list. You think you just fell out of a coconut tree? <laughs> you exist in the context of all in which you live and what came before you. And so he's not perfect but he is the best option out of the mere two that the state presents you with in the US. Do you want Kamala or do you want the man who saw the overturning of Roe v. Wade? Ask yourself that and then vote accordingly. Do not waste your vote just to prove a point and thus encourage the electing of the far, far demonic left. Vote against Amendment 4. And do not let, do not let Kamala Harris become president of the United States because I promise you, baby murder, that the ending of lives will be her religious sacrament. And so I also today wanted to take a look at, of course, our hot take. And as always, a very philosophical, politically philosophical and important one. That's why they're spicy hot takes on this show. And this was shared by Catherine Berbersinger. I, I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly. She's very much um, renowned right now, especially in the UK as in regard to her school. There was a great controversy surrounding it. She's known as one of the strictest head teachers. And she is 
really fascinating following a lot of her stuff, especially on X. She's very politically philosophical, maybe even historical in, with some things. Um, she shares a lot about children, of course, as a head teacher. And so it's really, really important. And she is responding in this hot take I've selected to a tweet that says, quote, The left now is not anything like the left was when he was a young man. So what is the point being made here? Um, This was just kind of a reply to something. um, And it's in regard to Thomas Sowell. And Catherine responds with the hot take, which is, quote, Good point. Those on the left used to be social conservatives. Social conservatism was universal across the political spectrum. Now, nihilism, hedonism, excuse making, victim hierarchies, truth, allergy, and absolution of guilt are what drives them. And oh my God, I mean, you can see she's a head teacher with some of that language. Isn't it fascinating? And isn't she bang on? I mean, I've discussed this with my mum a lot. It's, it's fascinating to me. I've probably discussed it on the show too. The way in which the twisting of the old school left vote has just manifested. Whether it's in the US or over here, I'll use the example, the old school labour voice that used to be encouraged. I mean, the traditional red wall, we might call it in the UK, their voice and how much that has shifted. The old left voice. I mean, when you think of those traditional Labour voters, the miners, you think of people who are actually in their cultural views, their social views, traditional and pretty conservative. I mean, you can imagine how so many of them respond to the issues of today, like gender ideology. But it's not just the UK, where this utter shifting of who the left is, of the spirit of left-wing politics has taken place and how it's become so much more radical and turned into your green-haired TikTok influencers. It's, of course, taking place in the US too. And I'm going to link here to another viral tweet, this one shared by Jamie Quint, and it appears to feature a political manifesto. And at the top of this, he wrote, MAGA! So, referring to Make America Great Again, the Trump Manifesto, before them writing, quote, Oh, wait, no. That's the 1992 Democratic platform. So, what I'm about to read to you was presented by the Democrat Party in 1992. Ready? We call for a revolution in government to take power away from entrenched bureaucracies and narrow interests in Washington and put it back in the hands of ordinary people. We vow to make the government more decentralised, more flexible and more accountable. We call for the restoring of basic American values, individual liberty, tolerance, faith and family. Our party's first priority is opportunity. So you're getting kind of capitalist vibes there. The current president with no interest in domestic policy has given America the slowest economic growth, the slowest da-da-da-da-da, and the American people know the long recession reflects not just a business cycle but a long-term slide so that even in a fragile recovery we are sinking. The ballooning deficits hijacked capital from productive investments. Oh my God, look, we reject both the do-nothing government of the last 12 years and the big government theory that says we can hamstring business and tax and spend our way to prosperity. This is coming from the Democrats. We believe in free enterprise and the power of market forces. We must also tackle spending by putting everything on the table, eliminate non-productive programs, achieve defence savings, and so on, so forth. Governments don't raise children. People do. People who bring children into this world have a responsibility to care for them, to empower American communities. We pledge to restore government, so on, so forth. They talk about making sure that crime-ravaged communities are saved and etc. Isn't that fascinating? I mean, the world, it's just, it's gone so far left 
that now many of us who are waking up to it and are seeking some sanity are being portrayed as right wing, as far right, when actually back then, in 1990, we probably would have been pretty left wing. (laughs) <laughs> with those basic values. I mean, even Obama was known as somebody behind mass deportations and a pretty controlled border. And that was only 2008 and 2012. But the last just decade or so, the left has turned into the new left and it is infiltrated by wokeism. I mean, the established right is also going left. The left is going further left and so we're all looking far right and so isn't that just so interesting i love these philosophical kind of takes it is all one establishment and we must acknowledge that ultimately it's not so much about left versus right anymore but it's about waking up to the lies of the far left to the lies of the political elites and to the lies of those who are corrupt in general so it really is just super interesting how the culture has evolved over the years and that is why I love acknowledging stuff like this and why truth should be our utmost priority. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching this episode. I really do hope you enjoyed. Oh my goodness, it's gone quickly, but it also feels like it's been forever. I mean, it's just great being here, welcoming discussion, and that is what this is all about here on Utter Truth with Hayden Appleby. We will hopefully be back next week with a brand new episode. Please do hit the like button below if you enjoyed. Leave a comment. Let's welcome more and more discussion because we are here always. We're going nowhere in standing up for truth, for what is right, and for ultimately freedom now more than ever. Lots more interesting stuff to discuss and plan to discuss next time. Have a wonderful, wonderful week ahead of you. Lots of love, and God bless you all.